I've got quite a lot to that I can talk about, but I want to be able to address what you actually want to hear too, because you've probably some of you will have heard me bamble on for hours in other places. I was going to talk about pasture boiler production and how that works on a total closed loop on the farm, and then halfway through start talking about pasture layers. So it's quite a lot to cover. But maybe if you want to interrupt and ask specific questions, feel free to do that, because that's more fun, I think. But there is a microphone over here. They would prefer if your questions were on microphone. If that's too slow, then I'll just repeat back questions, I think. But don't, don't be shy to interrupt. Otherwise, I'll just waffle on. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So let's jump into it. So my farm became known for pastured boilers very quickly because there wasn't good chicken available in Sweden. There was no organic chicken. There was just mass-produced, something like 45-day-old, 1.2 kilo, emaciated, fecal pathogen-infested factory farmed birds. So this became... I never set out to be a chicken farmer at all. I don't really eat chicken, don't really like chickens. I like the ecosystem services of layers, but I never set out to be. I, I wanted to choose enterprises that fit my farm. And we have a small farm, so livestock-based, the only thing that's economic is poultry. Poultry all over the world will be more profitable than any of the larger animals, just because of the amount you can fit in a small space. And so therefore, the ecosystem processes that they can deliver are immense. And it's been poultry that's radically transform, transformed my soils. It's a very useful enterprise. It's got flaws. Right? The flaws are we're based on industry genetics. These are F1 hybrid birds. And we're importing feed into our farm. Right? They're the two weak points of this enterprise. But I still stand strong behind it because... My bottom line that I'm managing towards is it must be good for soil, it must create a better quality product than customers can buy in the store, and it must make me money. And it does all of those extremely well. I am yet to find anyone who can show me numbers that I find impressive with heritage birds, possibly with dual purpose birds, but it's, you know, farming's a numbers game and it's hard enough as it is. There's nothing wrong with F1 hybrids, it's just the companies that own those genetics don't have a holistic bottom line, right? So there's five families that own all the poultry genetics in the planet. And so I buy my day-old chicks from a hatchery that produces, like, all of Sweden's chicken supply. So those day-old chicks can go into organic or non-organic production. They've not eaten or drunk when we buy them, so they service all of it. So that's a flaw, and it's a problem, but... There's no better cash flow enterprise you could start on a farm. Right? In, I sell chicken for about £10 a kilo, which I'm seeing UK uh, farmers do on my trip along the south coast. That makes it a very lucrative business, and you've got a high-value product you can sell in eight weeks. There's not many other things that you can do that with on a farm. And it's instantly scalable and retractable. So this is by far the best cash flow enterprise that I've seen on small farms and that makes it worthwhile and then if you've got some idealism then in the background while you're building up your customer base and making money you can start educating your customers to the benefits of pastured rabbits and pastured geese and the things that we might end up having to eat when shit hits the fan as it were right? but you can't start idealistically we are playing in the global food system even if we're small regenerative farmers so we have to play by those rules. So you can see, I have talked yesterday, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with the farm, but we have key line agroforestry systems sitting up over the top of our pastures, and we've used poultry to cash flow. The business plan we set out with was to pay off all debts in five years and earn a city wage. Because I'm involved in education, the only thing that is useful for me to show someone from the city in Stockholm to come out to the country and repopulate the rural environment is if they can make a good living. So, you know, in Sweden, that's five grand a month is a basic low wage, like living wage. 
So if you can't do that, it's not really realistic to get young people involved in farming because why would they bother? And, and especially in Sweden, where the welfare system, you get full-time salary for not having a job in Sweden. <coughs> it's a very tough climate. We want to only raise these birds outside, right? So we can do about just less than six months of outdoor production. It looks like this most of the time. And so we have to basically run, we tailored our production to that short season. Here, obviously, you would probably have an eight-month season. And it's the shoulder seasons so that are challenging with wind and rain, especially. That's where birds will suffer. And we're aiming, we target our production around 2.2 kilo dressed birds. That's a good sized family chicken. Unfortunately, 50 years ago, every housewife and probably most house husbands knew how to butcher a chicken. Nowadays, one in 200 knows how to break down the chicken. So we educate our customers because we only sell whole chickens. You need a license for your processing facility that's quite easy to get, actually. But you need a whole other license if you want to break down carcasses into cuts, which isn't so hard to get, but time, money, it's not worth it for us. We just sell whole birds. We sell whole trays of eggs. We like to work on subscription and pre-sales because we want to cut our sales down to a couple of hours a week. And it's all direct marketed straight to the end consumer. That's why it's profitable, because we have all our time focused on very efficient productions and very little time on sales and a very robust intimate connection to our customer base of five or 600 families that buy everything. Something Joel Salatin always said is that it's much easier to find a thousand, uh, sorry, 100 customers that will spend 1,000 euros with you a year than finding 1,000 customers that will spend 100 euros a year. And that's totally true in my experience. Having a diverse product portfolio helps you sell everything. So I'm a big proponent of mixed farms. If I've got eggs for sale, Mrs. Jones is coming every week or every month or same frequency. And so it's very easy to sell a chicken, some beef, some vegetables. So having a diverse product portfolio has helped us sell a very large amount of products from a very small space in quite a harsh farming climate. So we aim for 2.2 kilos. And the way we do that, we raise Ross 308, which is a kind of Cornish cross. And we slaughter them over three weeks. Obviously, the cockerels grow faster than the hens. And so to get a consistent weight chicken, we'll slaughter over three weeks. And so we have 20 weeks in a row where we're slaughtering three, 400 birds. And selling about 5,000 is about what we can sell in our catchment, our food shed, let's say. The thing that's impressive about my farm, I would say, is that we sell a lot of products in the middle of nowhere. Like in a, you can't really relate to maybe in the UK because you can't be in the middle of nowhere, but we are very remote. We're not near, we've got about 75,000 people in an hour drive radius around us. So the equivalent here would probably be a five mile radius that we're selling products. Like people in Sweden will drive 50 kilometers to go for dinner at a restaurant. So everything's a bit more far apart. This enterprise starts in the Bruder, and that's critical. Right? This is the foundation. This whole enterprise is very simple, but it's all about discipline and rigor. So the Bruder is the most important foundation. If you get the Bruder right, you can keep your mortality down to 1% to 2% for the whole batch, and that's very good. The industry standard would be 10 I don't know. It could be a lot more, depending on the facility. So we're taking extreme care here. Temperature is everything. Humidity is everything. But basically, you're providing a carbonaceous diaper, as Joel Salatin would say, and you're creating a living deep litter. So we put this material in, and because we're slaughtering over three weeks and the birds are in the brood of three weeks, the day that these birds come out, the new batch go in. And we do that back to back to back for as long as we can throughout the season. And so this is just sawdust, right, and not wood chip. Like the material is very important because chicken manure is extremely high nitrogen, right? Wood chip is extremely high carbon. It's very hard to capture nitrogen. This is the basis of making compost, right? You're capturing volatile nitrogen with stable carbon. 
wood chip is way too high carbon, but you can't use things like straw. It doesn't uh, work for little chicks' legs. They need a, a nice, stable platform to walk on. And we monitor the temperature very precisely. We have uh, a, a sheet here, because in the industry, they would take the birds out after a month. We want to get them out after three weeks. The quicker they go outside, the better they forage. Right? And we encourage foraging from the beginning. So after a week in the brooder, we'll start cutting sods of turf and bringing them into the brooder so that the birds get used to walking on grass and pecking at grass. And what you find is the quicker you get the birds out, and if you do time-controlled feeding, they graze a lot more. These birds are nothing like layers. A layer hen managed properly moving daily in eggmobile setting will take maybe 25% of its diet from the pasture. A broiler's only really half a chicken, you could say. They take maybe 10% of their diet. Now, there's a common misnomer that pasture poultry, it will reduce their feed bill. Not true at all. Right? You're not reducing your feed inputs. Your feed inputs are going to be 40 to 50%. I've looked at the UK prices, and I'm seeing people sell slightly more expensive than I sell for in Sweden. And the feed cost is about the same as it is in Sweden. So the business side of it works if you dial in your um, enterprise. But the feed cost doesn't go down with pasture birds because they're running around all day. So they're burning energy. You've got to, you know, if you, when I started out, there wasn't any data I could base my feed sheets on. So I took industry data. But I already know that these birds live in concentration camps and don't move around much. So they don't burn much energy because they're in a temperature controlled environment. So I had to adjust the sort of sigmoid curve that I fed on. And I've just refined that. And because I'm an educational, uh, facility at the same time, I've done hundreds of trials side by side, and then the things that I've published are like our refined, you know, this is what works optimally. So we've uh, created just like a cheat sheet way of doing this. But you can see we drastically reduce the temperature down to ambient over three weeks. So it's a lot faster than the, or 25% faster than the industry do it. Very simple, low cost setup. It's got to be predator proof. It's got to be free of draft, but also ventilated. You need to be able to manage temperature, but that's just done by raising and lowering lights. Birds come in, they're flipped out of their boxes, and they're introduced to water. So these birds have never eaten, they've never drunk. So I'll take one in 20 and dip its beak in the water so that they know where to find it. Right? If I was running the farm just alone, I would use nipple systems, both in the, brood in the brooder and in the field pens. But I work with people who are often learning. And so I need fail-proof systems that I can check if they've checked. Right? So I use manual things often where I would use as much automation as I could if I can just rely on my own thinking. So that's an important contextual point. So you introduce the birds to the waterers. They teach each other. And they're on a very strict feed regime. So the American way of doing pasture poultry is often unrestricted feed for a restricted time period. That is lazy, you know. It doesn't produce the health and vigor in the bird, and it doesn't produce the same ecosystem services on the land. We are very specific with feeding to get the birds hungry in between so that they forage. And whilst it doesn't redu reduce the feed cost, it's vitamins and minerals that mean healthy, vigorous birds. A lot of people push back against these heavy, dual-muscled uh, birds because they've seen industrial raising where they have legs that don't function, they die of heart attacks. I don't have any of that. That is management alone. These are just double-muscled, fast-growing birds like all of the farm animals we eat. They're very useful. You know, why are hybrids useful? Because they're predictable and give you a reliable outcome where you can make a business plan and run a business. Right? That's why they're useful. So there are people around the world breeding new lines of broiler genetics that are outside of the big industry. That's quite interesting, too. But you can see this is like a cheat sheet. So we'll do 1,000 birds at a time in the brooder, but we keep them in groups of no more than 250 to minimize stress. Okay? And then we just have a cheat sheet where the first days they're just eating organic starter feed, and then we start to cut grain in. 
So we've done 100 different feed ratios over the first few years to find out how do we minimize the cost of feed whilst optimizing bird health and reliable growth. Right? So welfare of the birds is critical, and outcomes financially need to be predictable. So this just serves as a cheat sheet so that you don't have to do mathematics every day, and you can respond and you can find all these in my books and things. We never treat meat birds like you would a laying hen. If I want to pick up a laying hen, I can hold it upside down, and all birds, if you hold them upside down, they relax, they lift their head up so that their blood flow doesn't make them pass out. And you can carry a laying hen down the road, and it's fine. You can't do that with a heavy meat chicken. Right? When it's young, you can, but when it's grown, it's not designed to hold itself by its feet. Just like a little seedling vegetable is not designed to hold the weight of the root system when you pull it out of a plug tray. Right? So you have to treat them a little bit more tenderly. So the birds come out after three weeks, and they're on a mix now of grain and starter feed. And the reason we've come up with that mix is that you have different feeds for different stages of growth, but you're normally talking about big industry that's buying you know, hundreds of tons at a time and has a lot of silo systems. But that costs a lot of money for a small farmer, so we're, we've designed it around the minimal deliveries of feed, because the delivery cost in Sweden is very significant. Right? Every, everything in Sweden is very expensive. So you don't want to have to have different feeds being delivered for smaller, you know, we're doing 5,000 birds, it's nothing. So we need to plan it around minimal cost. So we do that by cutting the starter feed, which is higher in protein, say 21%. But after about four weeks, they want to go down to like 17, 18%. So we can do that by cutting it with local organic grain. So that's what they're on when they go out. And we raise them in these salatin pens. I'm just going to jump through some of these things. So we took the salatin model, because that was the only sort of useful data I could find around doing pasture meat beds when I started. And then we adapted it to our climate, because we're in a much colder climate. And also, the salatin pens, you know, you're lucky if you don't have a hernia by the time you've moved all the birds that day. So there's different models for this, and they have pros and cons. Like something I've said in my work over the years is I don't copy what I'm doing. I'm doing things for very specific, well-thought-out reasons, but it could look any way. You need to do what makes sense in your time, place, and circumstance, right? So you have this tallest Soskovich model from America. They're more comfortable. for You can access them and walk inside, but they're only fitting about 30 birds for the same sort of cost of structure. So they're not very efficient at scale. And then you have like the whole pasture schooner models, which is where you start getting into efficiencies when you're raising a 1,000 birds at a time, like a, a basically a polytunnel modified um, skid trailer. So those of you on bigger farms running like beef or dairy, you could be improving your economy and soil in quite simple ways on a bigger scale. Uh, but I started out with these modified salatin pens because I've got wolves, lynxes, foxes, all kinds of predators that you don't have here. There's even bears passing through. I've never lost a single broiler to a predator <coughs> right? in either of the methods that we've raised them. But what I've done with our pens is I've made them as lightweight as possible that we can pick them up, one at each end, or a small lady can pull that along without getting a hernia. Okay? And that's nice because we're working very manually on our farm. It's a human scale agriculture. And then I, I bolted all the pieces together so that these last forever. You can replace each individual timber. So they cost about 300 euros to build. But each of these pens is making me 2,500 pounds every five weeks. Right? The birds are out on average for five weeks. So there's, I wrote a, a builds book, which is about all the CAD plans of how you, like the cutting list and all the ways to build these infrastructure things. So this is just taken out of that. Very simple, very quick to make. And I can stand in the middle of that and bounce around. It's, they're very strong but very light structures. And then we use simple gravity waters. 
And we have three quadrants covered. That's really important. So we have water under the open segment, feed under one of the covered segments so it doesn't get wet. And birds are moved first thing in the morning. So I wake up, 6.30, coffee, move all the birds. Right? And they are ready to move. After a couple of days outside, they, they are ready to move. So it's very simple to move these structures along. And the birds, are, they want to go onto fresh forage. And then you see that they're really eating a lot of greens and nutrients. Um, then I started doing, uh, what we found was an issue was in the drought year in 2018. We had to refill the water for each of those pens, as 14 pens makes up 1,000 birds. That's a lot of management in hot droughts. So I wanted to be able to use automated water systems. So we just adapted some of these pens with bicycle wheels. And now you can fit a 1,000 birds in a structure. And they all have automated water. And then you have minimal weighing out of feed. Some people don't like to have the extra work of weighing out feed specifically. But it's really important to the outcome of the bird health. When I do a time-restricted feeding like that, I don't get a single death from heart disease or leg failure. Like My birds are super happy and healthy. And that's my marketing. I'm bringing people, my customers, onto my farm, and I'm showing them the slaughter process. You know, I have families come with their kids and watch their chickens being slaughtered. How many slaughteries would let you see that process? You know. And so this is creating very powerful connection with our customers. And the same with the birds in the field. I want, like Joel always says, farming should be aesthetic and aromatically pleasing. Like it should look good. Right? And it shouldn't smell bad. It should be nutrient cycles intact. And so that's what we're basing our models on. This model works very well when you start to get to the scale of like 1,000 birds at a time. It saves, it takes about 10 minutes to move a 1,000 birds in the morning. And it's been working very well. We have in the woods behind here, there are two pairs of nesting raptors. They sit and look at the birds. They've never taken one. And that we start by having the fence really tight against these structures. And as the birds grow and are more mobile and quicker to run around, we expand that fence. And in the end, it's actually a very open space. But we are training our birds with a drone. I don't know how much that helps, but I like to do that. So when the laying hens come, or the broilers, I love to fly the drone over them to get them used to looking. Chickens have two, they have a near and far eyesight. One is for looking down at the ground and finding food. The other is for looking up and checking out if there's predators. So I'm just training that because they've come out of an egg in Sweden, been shoved in a barn by an Englishman. They've never seen the outside, so I'm just trying to get them used to their surroundings. So what you'll notice if you've seen any of our videos or photos online, you never see poultry in the photos. I can take my drone off from the house 400 meters away, and the, the hens are already under the eggmobiles. So there's something about critical mass. When there's a lot of poultry in a small space, that is a very high-risk opportunity for a predator bird. Like if a, a predator bird damages a wing, it dies. So. If people have two or three chickens in their backyard, of course, they're going to get picked off by predators. But when you have a lot in a small space, it seems to be off-putting for them. Or that's been the case for us. We've had foxes sitting outside these broiler pens. They've never taken a bird. So it's been working for us very well. That's 6.30 in the morning, and they are ready to move. So we lay out the feed in a big line. And the birds come running across the feed, and then we just pull those structures over the top of them. We can do a bigger sort of field structure like a schooner thing because we have quite small fields and a lot of tree systems, so it's just impractical to turn them round. <laughs> Daily chores, very simple. Move, feed, water. The last week, so we slaughter at 56, 63 and 70 days. That's why I'm not certified organic. That is the only reason my farm is not certified organic. I want to control when I slaughter my birds, not some random guy in Brussels who probably does not raise chicken in his life. Right? These arbitrary numbers, like organic chicken must be 84 days old. That's got no relationship to the health and well-being of a chicken or the breed of chicken. 
So that one contextual point is enough for me to say, I'm not going to be organic. It's not good enough. I need to have precision in my management based on what's best for my soil, my animals, my pocket, etc. Right? So we're advocates of customer certification. Right? And we bring customers into the farm and show them how we do. And frankly, they can't buy anything like this in Sweden. It's, it doesn't exist. So they're happy about it. So feed and water in the morning. And we'll come back. In the brooder, they're being fed five times a day in the first week. And we're checking them a lot because this is where things can go really wrong. Like if it's too hot in there and the sun is coming through a window one afternoon, they can start pecking at each other's oil glands. And you, if you notice that on one, you come back in two hours, suddenly a hundred of them have it. So you need to be hypervigilant in the very beginning. Once they start to go out, that drops down to three times a day. But I can guarantee if you do unrestricted feed for a, a limited time, the birds will sit by a feeder and just peck at the feeder, and they will not forage. They won't move as much. Their legs won't develop so well. And it's an inferior product, and it's also not creating the ecosystem processes of these scratching feet. Right? So it's a really important detail of this. So it's very low input. When you're moving these Salatin-style pens, you either make a dolly, but a nicer model is this. You have to sort of flip under the end of the pen, and that lifts the back end off the ground that you can gently pull along the frame. But a nicer model is, is this, where you just stick little hooks on the back of each pen and have an axle that pulls it along. Right? That's, that's kind of foolproof, uh, that you can't squash any very young birds. This is what the roller pens look like in the morning. We've set up a linear electric fence with a smaller electric fence to create the next paddock. Maybe it won't show. doesn't matter if that's a... But you can see these things online if you're not familiar with it. Again, out in the field, we have these same cheat sheets for easy management of... Uh, like, I like to have systems at the farm that anyone can go to and step into that role. Because the boilers is about 30 minutes a day, except for slaughter days, they're busy. Right? So it's not an employee for doing boilers. They can do layers boilers and go and do the sales you know so what I need in my farm is systems that anyone can walk along and see what needs to be done visually and step in and there's record keeping to show if it's been done so it's a lot of systems of redundancy where you can everything's like visual management you know and that's a really important part of well organized farms organized workshops this is how the slaughter facility looks like when we've cleaned down like visual information is a very powerful tool for keeping things efficient and ordered. So I, that's how I like to run the feed sheets. So we have, <coughs> we basically have eliminated the need for excess deliveries. So we just have one broiler feed that also works for turkeys because turkeys are very hard to keep alive in the first six weeks and then they're very hard to kill. Right? And they start for the first six weeks on 28% protein. And you pay for the protein in feed. It's really expensive feed. So I buy turkey poults at six weeks' age because then they're down to 21%. That's the same as my broiler rations. So now I only need a broiler ration and one layer ration, which means I can fit three months' supply in one delivery, which is how long you can keep chicken food before it goes rancid. So I'm just minimizing my costs by thinking mathematically. You can make very cheap silos. This is a 200 euro silo that holds 10 cubic meters that we use for the local grain farmer. And so it's a very low cost startup enterprise that immediately, so something contextually, if you're not familiar with my farm, is every enterprise we're choosing, it has to pay back its investment and make money in the first year, right? Because that's the only way small farms can work, okay? This is salmonella testing. So in Sweden, the, uh, there's zero tolerance on salmonella. If they find salmonella, they will cull all your animals. 
regardless of the fact that it's not transmutable. There's just a total outright ban on it. So you can eat raw eggs in Sweden, and it's very nice in that regard. But every batch of boilers needs to be tested, and the eggmobiles need to be tested. And it's always really funny, because the lady that does inspections is used to, she has to do 800 steps up this barn, turn around, do 800 steps with like socks on her shoes. So when she comes to my eggmobile, she has to do 800 steps back and forwards in the eggmobile. So I always take a cup of tea and sit <laughs> and watch her do her thing. But it's, yeah, it's, it's part of it. So it's a cost there, but it's very low cost. And for slaughter day, birds come in. We restrict their feed, so we feed them the night before. No feed in the morning. You need to have empty-ish guts to keep slaughter hygienic. Yeah. Can you take the salmonella testing by yourself? You can. You need a vet to do it once a year, and you then do the remaining ones yourself. Yeah. Um, it probably costs about 990 pounds a year for the layers, and it's probably 250 euros a year for the boilers. It's not a very big cost in the scale of it. So they go, like this whole farm's been run by an ATV, basically. It's, it's people on the ground working with ecosystem processes, not machines. And so this is Slaughter Day. This is a slaughter facility. And because I'm a nice kind of guy, I've got all of our HACCP plans in English. So if you want to set up a slaughter, you can just write your name of your farm on the top and shove them to the inspectors. And we've worked really closely with the inspectors because all of this stuff that you're probably all familiar with, it didn't exist in Scandinavia when we got there. It's all quite novel. So, you know, the regulations are written for industry. We all know that. So there are no real clear definitions for small-scale slaughteries or eggmobiles. But what I found, I mentioned yesterday, is like because I came along and built these eggmobiles and because 50 other people in Sweden trained up with us how to do pasture poultry and built the same ones. Now the Swedish agricultural authorities are addressing the laws around this because they have to, because there's enough people doing it to make something happen, you know? So we can think of like regulations as totally fixed, but actually someone needs to go out there and stick their head on the line and then it can shift. Are there regulations in the UK? I have been to a couple here that I would not certify, and they are certified. Um, yeah. It's like the regulations are about protocol. They're not really about what it looks like, what it's made of. It's got to be cleanable, reasonably. I'm certified to clean with soap and water, and that's it. Right? And it's, it's just about protocols, which I'll show you what that looks like. So we built this with an old container. It cost about 10,000 euros to build. And we can run 350, 400 birds through there in a day. And we could do that as long as possible throughout the season. But it's scaled for the type of production that we can do. And there's a lot of, like, the way the regulations are written, it's very flexible to interpretation. So you need to inform yourself and know more about the critical control points than they do, and then they're probably going to accept it. But I have seen multiple places approve that I would not want to eat the chicken from. So it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that feels overwhelming, but once you've done it, it's like, oh, that was easy. You know, it's, if you get lost in all of trying to understand the regulations, it can be a bit overwhelming. But we have an outside kill station. Uh, we're using a lot of UK equipment from Sedgebeer. Uh, low voltage stunners, kill cones, etc. Uh, we just took this structure and just lined it with vinyl, like flooring. And we're allowed to take the wastewater in that IBC tank you saw and put it on hedgerows. They're totally fine with that. I wanted to compost all the offal to put it back on the farm, but that's allowed. But you have to have a registered composting facility that is in a closed container, which if you know anything about compost, you can't make good compost in a closed container because good compost is aerobic, oxygen-based. So we just get some of that 
taken away, and some of it sometimes disappears, but it's, <laughs> it's a big cost. You've got wet feathers and things that are getting shipped 200 kilometers to be burnt with fossil fuel. It makes no sense at all. So feathers, which pose no hygiene risk, sometimes <laughs> go somewhere. So we have the kill station outside. And basically, if you want to make a slaughter facility, it's all about workflow. It could be a single line. It could be different buildings. I have a, a student of ours who set up a facility in Sweden and works on her own doing 5,000 birds. And she has a dirty side and a clean side with no division. She just has a pair of boots here. And then she steps over an imaginary line to another pair of boots. And now she's in the clean side. So it can look any way. You know? It's worth going to see what other people are doing. But our birds are brought up here. This has got a tent side, so it's dark, and the birds are just very relaxed. And this is actually the most relaxed place in the, the whole process, because the birds are super quiet. Everything's quite relaxed. It's quite humbling to kill things all day. But it's, it's kind of a, it's something uh, very relaxed about it, too. It kind of puts you in a head state. Birds come through, and record keeping begins. That's really important, the record keeping. Right, so when birds come into the slaughtery, they are, the time is kept. So it takes about twice as long to, for the chickens to bleed out as it does to actually get them in the cone and cut the throats. We have to stun them with electricity. So by law in Europe, you need a stunner. Uh, you can go on like a two or three day training to learn to do all this. And I'm now certified to train people how to do all these things. So we've designed this in a workflow that each station is moving at the same speed. Right? Uh, so six birds come in at a time. Very simple scolder from Bee Kettle in Germany. It's not a fancy scolder. It's just a thermostat with a tub of hot water. And we're very specific about time and temperature. So scolding birds is all about time and temperature. We do 63 and a half degrees for 1 minute 15. You can do hotter for shorter, colder for longer. But I see often people don't get this bit right, and their birds don't come out the plucker clean. Our birds come out squeaky clean, no pin feathers, no, no feathers at all. So I've seen people that have two pluckers and three people managing that station. It's really an efficient way to do things. So scolding's an art, and it needs to be done really well. Each stage sets up the next stage. So you've got to dial that in. Really good plucker from Seipman in Germany. And the, that's the biggest investment, I guess, other than the chiller. It's a 1,500 euro plucker, but it's perfect for boilers, for turkeys. And then birds come across. So the birds are always moving forward. And this point, the evisceration table is where we take the guts out. We keep hearts, livers, lungs, necks, whatever we keep. And it's, where the first, it's the first point where birds are inspected for health to make sure, yes, this can pass through for human consumption. And by law, I have to do that. And very simple process. We can do three birds a minute all the way through. And then birds are inspected, washed down, graded, and put into a chiller in, in weight category. Uh, they didn't used to be. Now they are. Because what we started doing is because all the birds are slightly different weight, rather than have individual prices for every bird, to make it easier with digital payment, we just have weight categories, and you may pay slightly more or less for 200 gram differences or whatever. It just makes it efficient and easy to do that. So then every bird that's come through this process, the time it's taken to get through is recorded. The grade and the weight is recorded. And that goes back into our record keeping, which you also have to supply to the authorities. But it also means we can take temperatures. So you have to get the birds down to 8 degrees in 4 hours, 4 degrees in 8 hours. And you have to prove that every time. So we take the first bird, middle bird, last bird. And there's a whole sheet that's stuck on the door each week. And someone has to record the weights and check that those birds reach temperature. You have to prove that to the authorities to show you're doing your job. If you have a proper blast chiller, it's very easy to do that. So if you make this kind of facility, you should always invest at the scale that you can imagine growing to. You don't want to be buying blast chillers and then scaling up because people love your chicken and having to buy another blast chiller. It's expensive bits, right? So you always scale things to where you're going to end up. So very simple.
Can you see that playing? Is that playing? Yeah. Okay. That's a little roller pen. So normally that's got a tent over it. And you can see there, that's from Sedge Beer. They make a lot of good small-scale poultry gear in the UK. So birds are stunned. That makes them unconscious. And then you cut the carotid arteries to bleed them out. And then birds come in. They're scolded. And we take the feed off at this point so that they don't cut each other in the plucking machine because it's quite an aggressive, it's two horsepower plucking machine. So no sharp edges. Processing chickens is all about feel, muscle memory. There's very little cutting. It's using the physiology of the animal to make the knife do the work, as it were. I really love this process. I love workflows and optimizing workflows. It's really pleasurable to do. And there's something nice about this enterprise as we go from chick to finished product totally under our control. That's really nice as a farmer because often you're selling raw products and it's nice to, to have that whole process on the farm. And it's where you extract the value too. You know, if you can get someone to process birds for maybe two pounds or less, then it's worth outsourcing. But if it's, as someone told me yesterday, they were paying four pounds, 50, that's not profitable. Like that wipes out your profit. So then the case is, you know, it's a numbers game. But it's, if you've got the market, then it's worth investing in a, a facility. And I know there's someone in Ireland that built a facility for less than 10,000 euros. And I just was at one on the south coast last week on my holiday helping them with chickens. That probably didn't cost more than that either. So that's it. The birds go in, they chill down. Next day, we come along and package them. And guts get picked up by the gut truck. We put the water on windbreaks, hedgerows, like non-edible crops. Anything that fits through an 8 millimeter grid is technically wastewater. Might have little bits of chicken in it, but they don't care. They, if it's on non-edible crops, they're fine with that. Uh, so then regulations, I can forward stuff to any of you interested, but basically we have these control sheets for monitoring temperature uh, in the chiller. And with organs, that's even more important because organs are full of blood, so they have to cool even quicker. So organs go up in front of us on the evisceration table as ice water, like oh, cold water from the well. So organs go straight into cold water, and every 50 birds, if we sieve them, bag them, put them in the chiller, that will reach targets. So it's half the time of the actual meat. But then you need to produce all these kind of plans of how the procedures work. Like, how do we actually run the slaughter process? How do we ensure uh, hygiene? How are we cleaning down? How are we measuring temperature? You just basically have to outline how you're doing all this. And I've got all this in English that I can send to you if you like. How we package and transport, how we deal with wastewater, just loads of paperwork, and that can be overwhelming if you're new to this and you just want to farm, but it's actually really easy once you've done it. And I've done it, so I can just send you that, and you can send that to them, and then that saves you a couple of months of work, doesn't it? So that's good. And this is the health declaration. So we're actually self-certified. It means I, you could come to my farm and help me with processing. I have to show you how all the HACCP plans work, and you have to declare that you don't have yellow fever or uh, diarrhea and stuff like that. And then you're allowed to be working in the slaughter too, right? So it's a self-certified thing. You don't need vets present. You know, any larger livestock, you need vets, etc. But for poultry, it's remarkably simple. Uh, packing works, this is actually laying hens. You see the skinny birds with a lot more yellow fat. But, oh, that didn't work. Well, the, the key bit I wanted to show you is we use these hot water shrink bags. They're really good. Vacuum pack birds don't look very good, and they end up with a lot of spare plastic that takes freezer space. So presentation's everything, right? That's where we're out competing. It's like local, quality, freshness, 
and a little eye to detail. So I really like these uh, hot water shrink bags. You just have a clean scolder, and when the birds come out of the fridge, they're quality controlled again, because often birds that look a bit funny from scolding, they look perfect once they're chilled down. So we have a list of the birds' grades, A, B, and C. A would be like perfect premium. B would be like, oh, it's got a little nick in the skin from the plucking machine, but we know Mrs. Jones doesn't care, but we're not going to sell it to the restaurant. And C would be, oh, the wing's all bruised and broken from the machine, and so we'll keep that for us to eat. So then when the birds come out the chiller, we double check that that's still correct. And we have that labeling system on our actual labels because we know our customers intimately. So we know, ah, oh, they don't care if it's got a broken wing. So we can tell them, this one's got a broken wing. Are you happy with that? Yep, fine. Um, really important to make sure you choose proper labels for things. There are freezer labels. There are refrigerated labels. You need to know a bit about these things if you want that to work well. And so those birds go out. We've already pre-sold them. So they'll go out fresh. And any surplus is going straight to a freezer an hour drive away, where our main customer base is. And we're producing only in six months and selling year round. So we're <laughs> keeping a stock for selling through the winter. Um, that's how we deliver in insulated boxes. So when you deliver to restaurants or customers, you need to deliver at the right temperature, especially with restaurants. They check that. And these boxes allow us to keep 10 or 12 frozen chickens frozen for up to 12 hours. So it's a very low cost way of dealing with the transport situation. And then we built this little smoker. This is a, an add-on that we never planned originally, but we were wanting to find a way to deal with birds that had cosmetic blemishes, you know, like a nick in the skin. And we wanted to be able to supply cafes who couldn't handle raw chicken. So cooked chicken, they can handle, it's low risk. So we could take our damaged birds, smoke them, double the price, and now we have a speciality product and we have cafes that can keep that refrigerated for 28 days. So they loved it. Right? And so it's just an insulated room with a sauna heater. And you have to, again, have all these HACCP plans of protocols to get the birds out the facility and into that with no risk of insects. And you know, it's all quite simple, but you have to do all the paperwork. Uh, but that's built around smoking 50 birds at a time and a way of eliminating our waste, essentially. I think my clicky is not clicking. We're approaching halfway through the session, so I want to start talking about layers, but I do want to address any things that's come up for you about broilers. This is the smoke birds, and this is a pooled product that we sell to cafes um, that's been very successful. I might skip over turkeys. Turkeys are even e easier, even more profitable. They just need an electric fence and a gobbledygo. This is a highly overbuilt structure because if you have 200 birds on there, right, that's over a ton and, it's a ton and a half of turkeys sitting on that thing. So it's quite well engineered. And they move around every second day in there with 400, well, 100 meters of poultry fence, so around 400 square meters of space. Very easy, especially if you're buying in poults. Like, you don't really get any losses with turkeys. Uh, once they reach six weeks, they're very tough. A lot more fun than chickens. Uh, but there's no market for it in Sweden. Right? If I could sell 1,200 of these a year, I'd, I would make a family income in Sweden with that. And it's very little work. And it's much quicker through the evisceration process because they're such bigger birds for the time. So I would love to actually focus more on turkeys, but Swedish people don't really eat turkeys. So, um, But I'll buzz through that. I've put together pastured feed sheets because I couldn't find any pastured turkey feed sheets anywhere in the world, actually. So I had to make it up and then test it in the field. Uh, but I, that information I have in my books and things. Any questions about 
spoilers specifically before we jump into laying hens. And just to say, turkeys, on the other hand, are ferocious graziers. They're taking 40% of their diet from pasture. You can see here, they've grazed very heavily next to their pen there. And they're just cool. Like, it, you can see that they're very closely related to dinosaurs, and if they were a little bit bigger, they would take you out. So, just a quick question on the feeding of them. Yeah. You were feeding on the grass in front of them and then moving the birds onto the feed, having put it out? On the roller pens. In the Salerton pens, we put them in metal feeders. The, with the laying hens, we just feed straight on the ground. The inspectors say they don't like that because the chicken can, could contract something from the ground. It's like, well, hang on. What's the chicken do all day, every day? It's like, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I just ignore them. <laughs> this is how I relate to, like, if a regulation does not make sense, I'm not going to follow it. Like, I'm not being negligent, and I'm not encouraging anyone to be negligent, but not feeding chickens on the ground because they might peck at the ground and contract something is moronic, <laughs> right? And it's a very different scenario with, you know, you have free range, make the egg carton green, consumers are happy. But if you ever look at free range egg farms, they are bare soil around the house with a bit of grass around the outside. Not good for chicken. Of course, there's risk for parasites and problems. When you move animals onto fresh ground every day, you eliminate nearly all of the pest problems just by natural sanitization, you know? So, Maybe you have to supply some feeders and have them there when they come and inspect, but you don't use them. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy doing that because I'm doing time-restricted feeding. They're eating all that feed instantly. So it's not like I'm chucking food around and it's, there's no wild birds getting attracted. It's like they're eating it straight away because I'm trying to get them hungry in between because that's what stimulates movement and kinetic energy on the ground and foraging for nutrients. So. Yeah. Okay. What percentage of um, birds do you sell to customers? Can you give us a question again? Now, like for years, it's been 100% to direct to customers. And we've built, like, we've had big, there aren't so many restaurants where we are because we're in the middle of nowhere, but we did have a big spa that's quite famous. Uh, in the summer months, they were spending. 100 grand a year with us so we and they were our closest possible customer so we would do a bit special for them because it, it's perfect customer um, but our demand for private people just kept growing and that's better money for us so we want to feed real people real food so we've shifted all to that yeah but we started pre-selling so we made a currency called a ridge dollar which is the original Swedish currency is a dollar and Ridgedale, Ridge Dollar, it sounded kind of like the farm's called Ridgedale because it's the property is Orson, which is a ridge in Swedish, and it's in Freaksdal and the dale of the Lake Freak, and so it is Ridgedale. But it was a cute play on that name, and it's it got on national primetime TV at six o'clock, and I'm there talking about bringing down the agriculture system with small scale whatever, and suddenly we sold loads of chickens. So, <laughs> so we pre-sell everything. Right? We're, we're selling this up front so that we know how much to produce. But we know what we don't know, and we know what we're capable of producing. Like, if you've not done it before, you need to be a bit careful. Hello. Um, I appreciate your angle, as I'm sure many of us do, on pointless regulations and uh, how to treat them. But I was going to ask about food wastage. Uh, that's just been asked you to answer that question. Um, We've got a small-scale farm shop, same as you. Poultry is the last piece of our puzzle. But we've got beef, pork, lamb, everything else. Um, and this is very interesting. We've got a lot of people asking for soya-free. Uh, have you done anything with soya-free? We're looking at growing lupins and putting that in the mix, possibly. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing. I prioritize the feed that has, in Sweden, we have a lot of fish meal. But it's all swings and roundabouts because it's from the Baltic Sea. It's fish waste. Baltic Sea is pretty polluted. It's getting better, they all say. Salmon and trout are coming back in. But I wouldn't want to eat fish when they're really 
but I would rather feed a chicken meat protein than vegetable protein because a chicken is an omnivore. It's like having a vegetarian dog. It's like you have to be a little bit wrong in your head to think that that's okay. <laughs> right? And sorry if that's offensive to anyone, but it's not right. <laughs> like a chicken is an omnivore. It's designed to run through jungle thickets eating insects. And so the way we're raising them is to get a lot of pasture insects in them. Now, there's a limit to that. Right? It, the, you, there's a lovely model of following the cows with the chickens, but you need 100 cows to feed one of my eggmobiles with insect protein. Right? So it doesn't, and it doesn't work because well-managed livestock needs to... The area you're giving them every day is going to grow and shrink depending on your grazing plan, whereas the chickens are in the same sp size space every day. So it doesn't actually work out um, perfectly. I would go for animal protein. I think they've just started allowing insect protein. Has that come to England? Because that will be the ticket. That's optimal chicken food, right? Soya is not really good for anything other than some Japanese people who treat their soya very carefully in ancient ways that they know how. Soya is not really good food for anything, is it? Field peas may be slightly better, but if you can get Animal-based proteins in there would be better. Maybe that's... I don't know that here. Does anyone know that? Where do you get fish? Live insects are allowed, so it would be a numbers game to see if it's cost-effective. But my approach is get your foot in the door, make a better product than they can buy elsewhere, and then bring the idealism back in when you can afford to. But if you are too idealistic, you'll never start. Like, you've got to have your... You've got to be playing the game to have something to say about it, you know. Yeah. But that's what we have is fish-based protein. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm Mambut from Sierra Leone. Uh, very impressed about uh, your keeping low on the mortality. Yeah. And uh, I want to know how you manage or you control diseases such as uh, uh, fowl pox, you know, uh, bronchitis, bronchitis and other things. How bronchitis is, thank you, yeah, we don't, I mean, we're lucky we're so far north that we have such a strong, heavy winter that a lot of disease pressure is mitigated because the ecosystem totally shuts down for six months and is deep frozen. That helps us with many things, particularly with crop production. Bronchitis is, like, basically, that's going to be... There's two elements to that. That's the only thing I've really seen, and it's brooder management like not putting enough bedding that they are getting fecal pathogens and these kind of things, or if birds are going outside in really unfavorable weather, like rain and wind. And so we're very careful in the brooder. Something I didn't say is the deep litter, that doesn't get emptied. So it ends up this deep at the end of the season. So the first batch come in, and I would expect mortality to be highest in the first batch, and I would accept 5% because there's no biology in that brooder bedding. It's just wood chips. So what I do, I've got about 20 centimeters of wood shaving. I've pressed it down to make it easy for the birds to walk on. Once those birds start, you know, they're growing exponentially. So once they start shitting, I'm following my nose, you know. You know if your brooder needs more bedding because you can smell. It shouldn't smell bad. And I'm just adding a layer of litter every time it's needed, which goes up more and more as the birds get big. But then when I take the birds out to the field, I take a watering can for every 10 square meters, which is also by regulation for organics, the amount of space needed for 250 birds up to 21 days. And I'll put one watering can of water over that brooder and then cap it with another few centimeters of wood chip. But now the second batch, my mortality will go down to like 1% because they've got a living nappy. You know, think about mother hen. Mother hen sits on her chicks. She's not going anywhere. She might run off, have a wee, come back, sit on her chicks. But there's a biology going on under the wing of a mother hen. And we're mimicking that through living biology in the brooder. So if you get the brooder really well run, you eliminate nearly all of the problems. Because things like bronchitis have their root in those first weeks. You know, it might take them six weeks to die, but they got sick right back there. Right, so aromatically pleasing, that's key. And then if it's unfavorable weather when we take them out, 
I'll either delay putting them out. Like we had a big custom order of a thousand birds for a very famous artist in the start of the season. And we wanted to supply it because it was good for our brand. But we had birds going out onto pasture in minus six with snow. But we had to get them out because we needed the space. They were already new birds coming in. So then we put straw on the ground to get them up off the ground. We wrapped every side of the boiler pen. We put fleeces over. We did a lot of extra work because that's what farming is, right? You're just responding to whatever needs responding to whenever it needs responding to. So that's how we've managed. And we, yeah, we don't have any other issues, really. Yeah. Cool. We, we One more question? Yeah, let's do that. And then we should move on to... I just wanted to ask, I've got two questions, and firstly I want to thank you for your IP, it's amazing you're giving all this IP away for free. Sure. So have you done any blind te testing, or tasting on the, on the meat? Yes, but not like, not scientifically, but just taste testing, yes. Okay. Yes. I can tell you a bit about that in regards to eggs too. So I... If you want, you can save it for when you come to the eggs. I just wanted to ask also, have you thought, of, is it worth looking at other varieties of birds, or this bird just works perfectly and just stick with it? For me, it works perfectly, and I, my season is so short. And it's like it works with slower growing birds, like you'd use an organic. around the flavor, you know, just focusing on the flavor. Flavor's great yeah, yeah. with these. Like, this pasta method and moving constantly is like there's no loss, there's no lack of flavor that. It's working with the birds. They're, our birds are moving a lot, and like chefs love them. It's not. I don't know if you would notice so much difference with like a breast or something like that. I don't know if you would know. But the, the texture different in the thighs where the actual muscle is? It's not like an industry boiler that's not moved ever. Like our birds are running around all day. But so I mean, yeah. does, that, does that manifest in terms of the actual texture? Texture the more than taste. I mean, they taste great. Okay. But, but you texture, you would notice the difference more. It's I more think. discernible. Yeah, I think so. All right. Like they have strong legs and yeah. But they're boilers, so they, you know, it's soft chicken still. Thank you. But, yeah. But I was going to put, I wanted to do uh, scientific testing of eggs and chickens against everything else in the store as partly my educational responsibility, but also my marketing. But in Sweden, that would have cost me about 180,000 crowns, which is like 15,000 pounds. And it's like I don't need to market that much because... I already have a customer base, and it's already been done a lot in America, for example. It's like we all know it's better. So I, I didn't choose to spend that money. Um, all right. Everyone okay if we jump into Les? Yeah? And I'll be around a bit. If you have more specific questions, you can contact me, or if you are building slaughteries and need help with your plans, then we can help with that. Eggmobiles, my favorite enterprise, actually. Um, we've only got half an hour, so I'll go really fast. I built these Eggmobiles specifically for my time, place, and circumstance, where I've got very short turns in the field around tree systems. And I needed, like, basically, the regulations are around roost space and nest space. And the thing that people have, I know people in the UK running these exact Eggmobiles, and I know some people have been told they can't or they have to reduce the bird numbers. And I know people that have responded to that by just building a second story, right? Like a square caravan size like box, and they've built a second floor above that in theory the chickens can have that space above, but they never open the door. It's another one of these stupid regulations. It doesn't make sense because at nighttime, birds aren't scratching outside. They're not eating. They're not drinking. They're only... Like, I let my birds out first thing in the morning. Boom, out they come. They go back in to lay an egg. They make a nice call. I lay an egg, I lay an egg, and they go back out. And then they don't go back in until roosting time. And they're definitely not getting up and scratching, and they're not eating or drinking. So that whole thing doesn't make sense. I had an inspector come, and we said, oh, we just leave the whole structure open every day. And they have all the outside to scratch. And they're fine with that. We don't. We close it up for predator, like secondary predator protection. So you maybe have to sort of work a bit around those things, but it's always doable. Like wherever you go, you can find a solution to that. Um, the trouble is bird flu, big issue nowadays. You've got to ask yourself, how far are you willing to go if you need to keep birds indoors? 
I would say if you're starting out in pasture poultry now, you need to make provisions to be able to raise whatever size batch of boilers you have or the laying flock you have. You need to provision for indoor space. And I've been promoting this model with polytunnels, but that only works because I have very cold climate. In the middle of summer, that would not be tolerable. Right? So you need a barn space or some kind of structure. And you need to have already planned that when you start this kind of business now, I think because it's only going to increase. Having said that, some of the commercially available eggmobiles are built for, this is touching on the question you had there, like there are plenty of studies <coughs> and you can find them online looking at nutrient levels between pastured and conventional. So I'm very, I'm talking about time controlled feeding, not free range. Free range is not good for land, not good for chickens, it's good for unconscious consumer there's nothing good about free range at all. It's not respecting the physiology of a chicken and it's not respecting the physiology of a grassland ecology. So time controlled movements, but we have to be able to provision for bird flu and some of the industrial, uh, like the Germans have several different companies making uh, eggmobiles that meet EU organic regulations. You maybe spend about 40 grand building one of these rather than this cost me 1,500 euros. It makes me 30 grand every season, right? So you, if you want those sort of structures, you can spend the money and get something that's already meeting EU organic standards. But they have this indoor space for keeping birds in bird flu. I've seen friends of mine, students of mine that have those. You do not want to keep your birds in there at all, like it, it's meeting the regulations, but it's not a good, like the chickens will cannibalize each other and it's not good. So I would provision for barn space, a neighbor's barn space, whatever, having some backup plan, because bird flu is only gonna get more and more and more. Some of that might be to do with the industry, mightn't it? But well, that's the way it is. But you can always, you know, you can look up your regulations for roof space, heights from ceilings, nest box entry spaces, and you can build something low cost that will work for sure. Um, you can also buy polytunnel skid models for layers, but layers need quite a lot more floor space than things like broilers. So you need a pretty big structure for quite a small flock that, unless you've got big flat open fields, it's not very practical. Here's an example of one of those commercial German models. So these meet organic standards. They have that extra uh, scratch space underneath. But the stupid thing about this is it's got a floor with the nests and roost spaces. Then it's got a conveyor belt that protects the birds that can go in the space underneath from getting shit on. So now you've got pasture poultry where you have to manually wind the shit out every day. This kind of defies the whole point of the enterprise, which is I never cleaned my eggmobiles out in 10 years. I want that manure on the pasture, and I want it moving on the pasture, so I totally radically improve my pasture. So I'm not a big fan of these, and they're very expensive, which most small farms can't afford. Super low cost, roll away nest boxes. Eggs in Europe can't be cleaned. You can use sandpaper, uh, but you can't use water or anything. So the key is having clean eggs from the start. If you have hay or sawdust in the nest box, you will not have clean eggs, right? And so we use rollaways, and it's very easy to build these at low cost. And you can also buy commercial versions. And then we just basically have electric fence and a portable solar energizer and gas hose, 8 millimeter gas hose. is really good for leading water. We have a reticulated pipe system around our field edges. So wherever animals go, whether they're up in the top of our forest or anywhere in the pasture, we can connect in with a quick release to that main line with a gas hose, which is 100 meters that fits on a tiny reel. And they can handle being dragged around fields so we can lead water to the animals wherever they are. Low cost, very simple, very modular. I could take over the neighbor's farm, whack in a couple of hundred euros of pipe and just move my whole farm onto their farm. Right? Everything's modular and scalable. These are these simple fittings you find here. They're like. 10 bucks and you've got a quick release pipe and you can bury them below the frost line if you need to have a frost free system. This is a very good, like some of you will be working 
in a modular way. This is the only solar energizer that's worth buying for poultry netting. Uh, it's a bit expensive, but it's got enough stored jewels that you won't have foxes eating your chickens. So putting up fence properly is a simple skill, but it's a skill. And having enough power running through your fence is critical. Like if you're getting foxes eating your chickens, it's because you're not got enough zip going through your fence line. So currently, this is, I was actually working with a Chinese manufacturer because the only models that were powerful enough that I started with went out of business. They were a UK company. So I started trying to get a manufacturer in China to make them for us because we need them. I lost a lot of money, got scammed. Now this company, Voss, is selling them. But these are the only portable ones good enough. If you've got fixed lines, you can have uh, fixed lines from the Eggmobile with wires running out to your fence. That works really well, too. I like portable mobile things because we're often moving into other people's property. Good fencing, you all know about that. Simple automations, this is a friend of mine in Ireland who's building like simple low cost automations. So you can buy a 100 euros of components and now you can have the light turning on and off at night, you can have the doors opening and closing, the nest boxes opening and closing that make this a very low input enterprise. Right? And they build a lot of soil. Like chickens, the ecosystem processes of laying hens is far greater than broilers because they're doing constant work on the soil surface. So you have to plan your grazing. I have larger livestock specifically to cut the grass for my poultry fences. It's the poultry making me money. Right? But uh, you have to manage your ground to have armoring. This field here is not in a condition that I would want to bring poultry onto. I mean, it's probably 50% bare ground. Chickens will turn that into a dust bowl. Right? So you need to manage grazing to armor your soil surface, because birds have a lot of impact. They can create a lot of good, but if you don't manage them right, they can create a lot of uh, destruction too. So it's poultry that have been mainly responsible for building our topsoil very radically, because we can fit so many of them in a small space. My clicker is it's not working. I want you folks to lead this a bit with questions, because I'm, I imagine some of you know more about our system than others, so it can be a little, uh, maybe you want to get into specific questions. Yeah, it doesn't seem to work. So I said we've been researching a lot of the first two years is doing a lot of data collection, working overtime to collect data to inform proper decision making. So we have all of our beneficial insects in the uh, manure of our larger animals have moved out after three days. And by day four is when our fly larvae are hatching. That's when we try and time chickens to follow cows to get that omega rich food. But as I said before, it doesn't always work perfectly because cows' grazing area is expanding and contracting based on a holistic plan grazing plan. And chickens are in a fixed area every day. So it doesn't always work out, but we try and optimize that as far as possible because it's much better for the land. These birds are basically acting as a biological muck spreader. So like after letting the chickens out, within 10 minutes, there are no cow pats anywhere on that land. They've spread it everywhere and they've benefited from all of these insect proteins. And that's really important. When I look at most fields in Sweden where the ecosystem processes are slow because it's so cold, people have cow pats there 18 months later. That's a sign of a broken nutrient cycle, right? You can judge the health of a farm by just looking at cow manure. You can tell exactly where the ecological processes are. And we want that movement to be as rapid as possible. Yeah. This isn't working. Okay. Yes, did you have a? Yeah, just um, a question. So, um, some of the profitabil profitability is uh, um, linked to obviously the length of the laying cycle and ultimately the quality of the shell of the egg. I want the shell in 
strength. Yeah. I wonder if you could comment on that with your system compared to a sort of conventional yeah. system. So I buy, I buy point of lay hens. These are hybrid birds, right? It's all a numbers game. And I love spreadsheets and dialing in little variances and understanding my business, right? You can make pasture poultry work with hybrid hens, but it won't work anywhere close to the numbers I can do with a hybrid hen, because I get 95% lay for 80% of their cycle, right? So I buy birds at 16 weeks old, point of lay. I know exactly when the first egg's coming. I know exactly when 100% production will come. And I keep them one year, and then I cull them or sell them to home chicken keepers, which when you, you know, I'm doing 1,200 birds, it's quite easy to sell them to the public. So we have a week where they can come, and they're willing to pay. So we buy them for 7 euros 50, and we can sell them for 15 euros after we've had eggs for a year. So it's, it's really nice. Um, an egg is a very, very strong shape. You should be able to take an egg between your finger and thumb and press as hard as you physically can and never break an egg. And you should be able to crush it in your hand that way and never break it. So we always have constant supply of oyster shell for the hens. We have like a simple gutter with a 45 degree gutter fitting. So we fill it up once a week and they can always take oyster shell as they need it. You must supply that. Chickens work on three-day cycles. If someone takes over egg collection and I'm noticing a higher level of cracked eggs, then three days ago, the oyster shell ran out. Right? It's like that. If you change their feed rations, three days later, your egg production numbers will change. So I keep a super tight record on my egg packery because I can, if anything changes, even by half a percent, I know I need to intervene now because I'll get a bigger problem if I don't. And it's really dialed in because this is a numbers game. You know, like I've been to so many farms as a mentor and I start unpacking their numbers and it's like, oh, it's only five <laughs> eggs less. It's like, okay, like now it's only 20 eggs less. Now we multiply that by 365 days and oh, we fed a bit too much. When you start multiplying these numbers together, like I love mathematics. But that's what makes farms work, is mathematics. So you need to have those numbers dialed in. But hard eggshells, pasture-raised hens with enough supply of things like oyster shell, you're not <laughs> going to have, you would only have deficient eggshells if the birds are sick, basically, I think. Yeah. Uh, so I have point of lay birds, keep them for one year, and that's because in the winter months it's very dark. I don't want to have a heated or lit space, and their production will drop down. And by April, when I can get my new flock in to get them on pasture, I cull the birds or, or sell them, and I will average 85% lay across the entire year. So if I have 100 birds, I get 85 eggs overall. But I need to know when I'm getting that 95%, and I also need to know where it's dropping in the winter, I need to know how many eggs I've got for sale because I've got to keep that consistent. So what I actually do is I get the new flock in so that my curve going down in the old flock production meets the curve going up in the new flock so I have a consistent egg supply. That's quite important. So it's mathematics. This is just a slide of the feed values that we have in Sweden that if you uh, particularly interested, I can send you that you can compare it to the feeds you have here. One thing that's a bit sad about organic layer feed is the methionine content. Uh, that's produced in conventional feed by lab bacteria, which isn't allowed in organics, which is really stupid because that would be a bloody good way to do it, and organic chicken feed just doesn't have that in the right way, which can cause problems to older birds. Did you have a...? Yes, yeah. if I could. Um, just going back to soil, and you're saying it's important to have holistic grazing to increase the pasture and the point you made about uh, poultry turning what's beat our feet to a dust bucket. Um, I'm just wondering, your slides, I'm, s I'm reading from it that you've got cattle. Would you have any comment on where lighter herbivores would be used in your system, for instance, sheep or goats? I have cattle and sheep, and 
they, like we've always sold beef and mutton as well as lamb, but it's not that, like all of our ancillary enterprises maybe make up between 40, 60,000 pounds of sales, but they're not consistent. We'll do like, oh, more of this one year, more of that. It's, they're not our bread and butter, as it were. Um, it's impossible at the scale we are to make a useful income, but we want them for their grass cutting, essentially, and we want to eat. So it's quite novel for a lot of farms to eat their own food supply. I have a milk farm that's set up at the same time as us down the road, and they buy milk in a store. And it's like that's normal, I guess, but it's like we are a farm that produces all of our diet first, and then we produce a few things to make our livelihood, and then we do some other things for a bit of pocket money and a bit of ecosystem services or whatever. Um, so the whole the grazing thing is there's been different animal numbers at different times, like up to 10 cows and up to 50 sheep, and that's, I mean, it's only five hectares of pasture but we're using our neighbor's pasture because they don't have livestock. And then we couldn't use their pasture, so that scaled down again. You know, that's, that's a flexible thing. But what was your question? I didn't really... Is there, uh, any, is there any increased performance preferences in terms of consumption or what you need to produce pasture? Is there any preferences? I think it's a density thing. Like, cows are way better at building soil than sheep. Sheep are just pretty rubbish at everything. <laughs> Really, and goats are even worse, aren't they? But um, cows are just way more inefficient chucking out compost in the back end. But it's a, it's a critical mass thing. Like, you can't create that kinetic energy with larger livestock on a small scale. You need a lot of larger herbivores and a lot of land. So that's where we're using poultry as a... It's the only thing you could do on a small farm. Like, sticking... 10 cows on 10 hectares, you can't regenerate anything, you know. It's not enough critical mass. So small farms are limited to poultry, really, I would say. And then you can really ramp up ecosystem processes because you can fit a, a lot in a small space. So the cows and sheep are supplementing and they're supporting that enterprise and giving us very high quality food, but it's not enough economy that we can rely on it, sort of thing. So, yeah. R Richard. Yeah. Regarding stocking rates. Yeah. Um, you talked about a thousand broilers and twelve hundred layers. Yeah. What sort of landscape scale are you working on? Because you mentioned working with neighbours as well as your own land. The neighbours' land was only been used for grazing cows and sheep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all of the poultry happens on our land. So five thousand broilers is a thousand at a time, five times basically. <laughs> And what That's scale of land for that? Uh, it's four hectares, of which it's probably only three hectares of surface. Great, thank you. But they go into weird bits on the sides here and there. It's, but there's a lot of trees and slopey bits that they can't go. And yeah. So rotation doesn't, you're regenerating the land on that scale with the rotation of that 5,000 over time? Yeah, radically. The, like, cows and sheep will go over every area four or five times. Layers will go over three, maybe four times. And broilers, we tend to only go over once. Right? There's a high level of nutrition, but that's another complicated layer to this, is that all agronomy data comes from poor soil husbandry or whiffery managed farms. There is no data from regenerative farms. So if you're getting data from somewhere, it's come from already damaged agricultural soil with poor practices. So by childhood logic, you know that good soil can tolerate a lot more nutrient or a lot more different circumstances. And that's what we see. I mean, we've recorded our soil building. And so when I put down X amount of nitrogen on my field, it does not, like if I put it on this field, I, re I reckon a lot would go off into the atmosphere. I reckon there would be surface runoff. My field would never look like this. Like this is, I mean, it's being used for different purposes, obviously, but it's, I'm not being negligent. I'm putting high loads down in a living system and I'm feeding that system. And then you can see the result of that in 
extreme circumstances like the droughts where all the fields around, you can see this on YouTube, this yellow landscape and the grasses have thwarted and I'm growing rapidly over my head. You know, I can't even see chickens. They're under the grasses making tunnels. And, and I'm using the cows to lay down a lot of my, you know, I'm trampling 40 to 60% of my forage specifically to armor and pay into my carbon account, you know, which a lot of grazers would do anyway without the poultry, but it's particularly good with poultry because I don't want bare soil because chickens will just open that up and make problems. Um, we're coming to close of time. Um, I'm not sure what I wanted to show you here, but my clicker doesn't work at all. Can you click forward and I'll just see if there's anything I want to show here. This is just an egg packery, very simple. There's again regulations around egg packeries. If you want to do any of these things, feel free to try and get in touch with me. I can show you regulation things. It's much more simple than you uh, imagine if you haven't done it before. Do you have a question there? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So. Um, <coughs> Obviously, you've been there about, what, you said 10 years you've been at uh, Ridgedale? Yeah. So you obviously didn't start with 1,000 broilers and 1,200 layers. Did you have 1, to... 1,000 broilers the first year. We pre-sold them. Uh, I had only been in Sweden for two months. <laughs> okay, perfect. But I, you know, I knew what I could do. So. Cool. Uh, but layers we built up. We started with an eggmobile and then just built one at... Like, uh, for me, I think training a lot of young farmers, it's like 350 hens is a good starting point. There's no point doing less because it's not that hard to sell the eggs from 350 hens. It's going to give you, like, 330 eggs a day. That's 10 trays. It's not a lot to sell every day. And it's a good number to multiply up. Like if you sell out all your eggs, then build another egg mobile. It's a good, it's a good starting number, and you wouldn't want to go less because you're doing the same amount of work and the economy's not there. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's no more work to keep 1,000 hens than 500. It just takes twice as long to pack eggs, but I can pack and grade and sort eggs from 1,200 birds in an hour or 45 minutes if I'm feeling perky. So. So it's not a, you know, you may as well, it's, it's a numbers thing. You've got to start at a scale that's giving you enough income that you want to actually do it. Yeah. Um, just a quick one. Um, with the amount of nutrition that you're putting into your pasture with you moving the poultry across it, do you ever move market gardening onto that land to no. benefit? No, no. keep them separate? Our market garden is totally fixed, permanent no-till beds. But we use the winter deep litter from, I would show you, but I can't move me slides. If you could bun, uh, go forward quite a few. Here you see, so we bring the birds through. They go on a deep litter system. And that's creating about 60 cubic meters of compost a year, which is way more than we need for our market garden which is a no-dig system, that uses a lot of compost in the beginning and then a very little bit every year after or every second year after. So we use it for mulching trees and things like that too. So their manure is being captured in part and being used for the market garden, but in, we want it in the grass, basically. So we keep it separate. Then we also, so winter feeding is an important one. I'll finish here. Uh, Birds in, indoors go stir crazy. So you need to entertain these girls, basically. You can do silly dances for them. You can hang CDs off the ceiling. You can hang carrots and cabbages just out of reach, you know, and that keeps them busy for hours at a time. But they, psychologically, when they're indoors for a long time, in, in my climate, they have to be indoors like five months. Um, you need to keep them entertained. Otherwise, they can get crazy and people have breakouts of of pecking problems and things like that. You've got to keep them stimulated. Uh, we run about 10, 15 grand of microgreen sales in the winter that then has a lot of unsprouted seed and little stems that provide some green stuff that would be a waste product otherwise. So all of the microgreen 
trays go straight into the deep litter and the birds spend a lot of time pecking out the sunflower seeds or peas or whatever it is. But that's really critical to keep the health of, like the winter stage is more tricky to manage. It's very easy to have beautiful birds out in the summer moving every day on pasture. But you really have to, you don't have to move them in winter, but you need to put that same time into keeping the flock super healthy in those challenging months. But we, we keep them with no water, no light, uh, sorry, no, no heat and no light. And I get to minus 45 where I live, but in the classical winter, it'd be minus 30. But down in that deep litter, if I scratch away the surface, it's going to be 15, 16 degrees. So it's like 45, 50 degrees warmer than, like the air in the tunnel is very cold, but the bedding is warm. So they have like little dust bath and they get down in there and that's, that's their heating and they do fine. Chickens don't really mind cold, they don't like wet and they don't like wind, like exposure more. And what to say about that? Yep, microgreens, chopping birds. Much nicer to sell birds live. That's what we've moved to in the later years because people... I didn't realize how much consumers pay for their backyard chickens. So I have a friend in Denmark who does, they make like a little chicken house and they give you a chicken starter pack and they make a killing selling their spent hens. That's a whole other thing in itself. So that creates the compost for our no dig market garden, which we'll talk about this afternoon if anyone's into market gardening. But yeah, I think we have to leave it there. So. I'll be around if anyone's got specific questions, but be in touch if we can help you with specific paperwork stuff that's just a, a pain in the butt, because we have all that. So, no. <laughs>